Thank you, Steve, very much. Appreciate that. Um, oh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, my colleague Beth Inodome and I work for a firm called the Podesta Group. Uh, we're a, we've been around for about 30 years. We're a public affairs firm in Washington, D.C. And what that means is we straddle uh, public policy, politics, and how all of that blends together in order to represent uh, companies and interest before the federal government. The bulk of our work is done on the government relations side that we call, which is uh, which is traditional lobbying, but we also represent a lot of foreign governments, including some of those who've most recently been impacted uh, by the president's executive order on, uh, on travel visas as well. Uh, but we also have a, a pretty robust uh, public, uh, public relations practice as well. So before, I'd like to get, before I get started, what I'd love to do is ask just a quick question. How many people have read news about President Trump the last week? If you'll raise your hand. How many people have tweeted about President Trump, pro or con, in the last week? Several. How many have liked something on Facebook in the last week about President Trump? So, not as, okay, we've got one over here. Congratulations, whether you know it or not, you're part of the new political dynamic that is happening in Washington, D.C. and throughout the country. Have you noticed here, if you notice here, this is the, uh, the digital engagement rate for President Trump surrounding the inauguration, but then also the Women's March, which has largely been seen as the anti-Trump uh, movement throughout the inauguration. If you'll notice, President Trump is over, was over 10 million engagements, or online conversation, over 10 million people uh, on the, leading up to the day of the inauguration. The Women's March was about 10 million uh, and, uh, let me take that back, three million fewer uh, during the same time period or just after that. And what does this, how does this translate? As you can see here, this is some of the online conversations that existed. Um, a lot of intensity throughout um, the conversation. We've seen this just in Berkeley last night as part of that, uh, part of the movement and part of the intensity surrounding President Trump and his administration. But the important thing here is that if you look at the conversation and how President Trump has, has utilized the digital format in Twitter uh, since he's been elected, you see a dramatic increase since he first started his campaign in February to where he is now. And here are some of the key people that he has, that he engages with on a, uh, on a, on a, on a regular basis. You've got Drudge Report, Ann Coulter, Joe Scarborough, Sean Hannity, and then shifting over some of the others, some of the top influencers on social media. And these are the ones that have been the accounts most mentioned by, Donald, by President Trump and then um, over the last year as well. Now you're asking, you're probably sitting there, what does this mean? And how is this changing Washington? What it is, is we're now operating in an involved bully pulpit, evolved bully pulpit. The president has always enjoyed a bully pulpit. Uh, the president can go to a lectern and can command attention at any moment and drive attention uh, to any issue uh, he cares about. We're seeing this now with President Trump. Just since his election, we've seen him target several companies um, throughout on Twitter, ranging from Toyota, uh, and particularly, he's trying to shape and change behavior uh, to, where he, to his line of thinking. Um, and I think you've seen some of the, we'll go through some of those key messages uh, in a few minutes. But what you're seeing here is it's not only the business community uh, that he's using Twitter, it's also his own friends within the Republican Party. Uh, the one on the lower right there with the New York Times, the House Republicans, when they were organizing, had changed their ethics laws or we're going to change the ethics rules that govern the House of Representatives. President Trump tweeted about it within about 12 hours, and they had a meeting scheduled uh, three hours later to basically revert back to the previous ethics laws. Uh, that's what you're seeing in Washington. You're also seeing it with other companies, and some, some companies were, that might have been, and Lockheed Martin uh, will give this example. Uh, Lockheed Martin was called out for the Joint Strike Fighter for being too expensive. In a, Trump by, or in a tweet by then President-elect Trump, uh, the company then learned after the second tweet to engage 
uh, with President-elect Trump on Twitter. Uh, Marilyn Houston, the CEO, now has been at several, she was in a meeting with the White House during the first week of the presidency, and you can see that um, where Lockheed is a good example of where they were initially targeted uh, by President Trump for, um, for the cost of the Joint Strike Fighter. They were able to engage, um, and they now have been, President Trump has, uh, has praised them for bringing, the, uh, for bringing the cost of the Joint Strike Fighter down. Now this is the context kind of which we're operating. What Beth and I will do in the next portion is really kind of give you a sense of what this means, and more importantly, how you and your companies uh, and your interest can engage in Washington and, and advance your priorities. Um, and we'll, we'll outline some of the things we see where House Republicans um, are working with the Trump administration, some of their key priorities, and then specifically where science and technology, or science and innovation technology fit into that. And then we'll walk through a little bit of the budget as well. Building an effective engagement strategy in Washington. Here are the four things that we're beginning to see that it, that it will take. Um, and as I mentioned, we've been doing this for a long time. The company has been doing this for a long time. I personally have been lobbying for nearly six years now, but I also worked on Capitol Hill for 10 plus years, and Beth has a, has a long history as well. Tune into the key messages, the key themes of what President Trump, um, and we'll pace through these uh, as part of the presentation. But one, tune into the key themes that he's pushing. Know the key influencers and decision makers, and then take advantage of the aggressive agenda uh, and schedule that we'll see. President, Trump, President Trump's 100-day mark, which is traditionally the, uh, a, a judging point for a new president, will be on April 29th, 2017. So that's a key date that a lot of people are driving toward. And then more, most importantly, engage. Engage at the federal level, engage at the local level as well. Tuning into the key themes. These are not going to be a surprise to anyone. These are direct quotes from the inauguration. Um, President Trump to the world, America first. Uh, we've seen those stories. This, is, this has been a campaign, th this was a campaign theme for President Trump, and it has become a theme of his, the first two weeks of his presidency as well. Uh, very much a focus on, in, in most of the things that he, he says and he mentions its focus on America, American workers, um, and then the, the second major theme that emerged after the inauguration was more of a populist theme, to the, and a message to the American people, it belongs to you. Now how can you, as a company, why do you want to pay attention to those key themes? Uh, how many of you have investment plans to, or have plans to invest in the United States in the next year. A few hands coming up here. What I would encourage you to do is engage with the administration and send them, and, and send them a, whether that's via Twitter, whether that's through the agency process, because if you flag that you're investing in, in or you're creating 20 jobs in several of those key states that Trump won, uh, that were kind of the industrial Midwest, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, that's going to get on his radar screen. And that's, that's part of why I say in, it, pay attention to the key themes. Um, because it's very, because of the Twitter, uh, because of President Trump's kind of digital following, that can easily become, you can be highlighted and praised for your investments and your, your actions as a company, but you, you can also be targeted as well. And it's, all, it's something, unfortunately, you've got to keep in the back of your mind as kind of you move forward uh, and make those key business decisions. Second um, strategy for engagement is know the key influencers and decision makers. This is who, these are the key influencers for President Trump at this point. If you'll know, you've got loyalists on one side, uh, Steve Bannon, is, or Vice President Pence, has largely uh, been tasked with the machinery of the government and the interagency inter process, working with Reince Priebus, who's the chief of staff on the bottom right. What I mean, the, the process of the interagency, I think everybody will talk about the executive order uh, on visas later, but that's a good example where the interagency process, the president working with the Homeland Security Secretary, the Department of Defense, and the Department of State, 
that process was not, um, was not coordinated effectively and you ended up with a very inefficient and clumsy rollout. And I think everybody agrees that. Part of what you're seeing now is Ryan's previous chief staff taking over that process to make sure that it's that executive orders and things and major announcements from the White House are coordinated so you don't have that, uh, so you don't have that confusion that's created. Other uh, loyalists, uh, Jeff Sessions, uh, the Attorney General designee, uh, Steve Bannon is another um, that, it, that is out there and, and has a key, has the ear of President Trump. Uh, you've also got family. Um, the one thing I would notice there is that Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, has emerged as a key confidant of President Trump. Uh, he was at, and, and one of the things that we do in Washington, those of us who follow this on a daily, hourly basis, is we look to see who's at the table on important meetings that the president has. Jared Kushner has been at the table, one next to President Trump, to his right-hand side on a cybersecurity announcement earlier this week with President, or with uh, former Mayor, New York City Mayor Giuliani, but then also he was in the, um, he was in the uh, Black History Month uh, meeting yesterday with the president as well at the table. So that's always an important one. You look at the staff who's behind the president, but then you look at who's at the table as the president's staff as well. Uh, Ivanka Trump, of course, and then Eric and Donald Jr., they were very influential uh, in the campaign. They'll continue to be influential, although they're, they're, taking, a, they're taking over uh, the business interest at this point. Vice President Pence. As we talk about, there's, there has been a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, I, th I think there's so much coming at people from President Trump at this point uh, that sometimes it's good to take a pause to see, okay, where are some of those, where are some of those unnatural and natural allies of those key influencers? Vice President Trump, or Vice President Pence, is going to emerge uh, as a key conduit to Capitol Hill. And if you look at who he uh, co-sponsored legislation with, there's actually some pretty interesting names there. Zoe Lofgren from here in the Bay Area is a, is a futurist, a technologist. She's someone who, uh, who can, when you look at what they co-sponsor together, that should, give you a little, that should give you hope within the technology uh, and science communities. Uh, Joe Crowley, uh, Adam Smith is another one of those who's the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee. So these are some of the things where part of what we think about uh, at the Podesta Group on, on uh, behalf of the optics and photonics community is where can we advance science and technology and what uh, relationships do we need to try to tap into to do that. Some of the other, uh, some of the cabinet confirmations to date, we've been seeing this. Uh, I don't know if many people saw Rex Tillerson officially welcomed at the State Department today. Uh, he had a very, um, he had a very warm welcome, which was good. So we've got six confirmations at this point. Uh, Secretary of State Tillerson uh, will play a role um, in the science and technology. And then we've got uh, General Mattis at DOD and then uh, General Kelly at Homeland Security. And then Elaine Chow uh, has, been, uh, has now been sworn in at transportation. And several key appointments of date are today, or several key appointments, and we're still going through the confirmation process. This has slowed a little bit, but we've got um, Wilbur Ross at Commerce, Betsy DeVos at Education. She appears she might be the one who, uh, there's been some opposition to her within the Republican ranks. So these will continue to play out uh, over the next week or so. Uh, but, and most, um, I think most are now heading to a Senate confirmation vote. And then here are some of the key, with science and technology, here are some of the key uh, quotes from some of those key secretaries as they're moving forward. Secretary Mattis um, has, been, has been a proponent of science and technology. He is a traditional warfighter, but he's also a, a proponent of science and technology, uh, very much engaged with DARPA. Secretary Perry as well. I know a lot of people are focused on energy. He's one of those that, um, he's from an energy state and invested in renewables. Uh, particularly solar, while he was the governor, and then um, Secretary Elect or Secretary Designate Ross, and then Secretary Designate Price at HHS. And what I would also mention here is um, there are several others that we're. Dr. Collins will continue at NIH. Um, Dr. Cordova will continue at NSF. 
Uh, we still have, we're still waiting for someone from OSTP, although there are two names that have been mentioned. And then uh, we've got several names that have been mentioned at NASA as well. Uh, Congressman Bridenstine has engaged with the optics and photonics community in the past. Uh, he's from a, he represents a district uh, that understands that the unique nature of, of space exploration that has to be a public-private partnership as well. So he would be an interesting choice there. And then what I'd also mention here is that this was, to, uh, this morning, uh, the president has stood up what he calls the President Strategic and Policy Forum uh, to provide an opportunity for business CEO, or for businesses to engage directly with the president. Um, who that meeting is this morning, or who's in that meeting, you've got the CEO of Tesla, Elon Musk, you've got the CEO of Uber in that meeting, you've got the CEO of IBM, and several others. And they're focused on issues that I heard, I sat on the CEO panel yesterday, they're also focused on those issues that you care about. Now let's move into the, what those issues are. Uh, these are the top agenda items for President Trump and Republicans as we move forward. Uh, roll back, um, the Obama administrative actions and over-regulation. Uh, President Trump signed a, and this is an opportunity um, for your community because, the optics and photonics community, because the goal here is to get government out of the way of innovation so that you can push the edge of the envelope and deploy that innovation uh, to, uh, to consumers. Um, President Trump signed an executive order. Two regulations have to be repealed for every one regulation uh, that is enacted and that is adopted. Still waiting to see how that plans, plays out. Uh, the next one that's got a big focus is U.S. border security and homeland security. Uh, we've seen that with the executive order to build the uh, wall on the southern border. Uh, we've also seen that including the travel visa restrictions as well. Uh, what I would point out, we had talked about the clumsy nature of which that was rolled out this weekend. Uh, they are, the White House is working with the agencies now on implementing guidance for what that means, what that travel ban means. Um, one of the things we've seen with the Republic of Iraq especially is there are quite a few uh, interpreters that help the U.S. military uh, that are traveling on special immigrant visas. Those have now been clarified. Uh, per, uh, uh, permanent residents have now been clarified. So they're, they're continuing to work through that. I know H-1B visas um, are another one that's kind of that the industry is tracking. Um, I've heard rumbling. There's rumblings in the executive order kind of focused on that. We'll see how that continues to play out. Uh, third, repeal the Affordable Care Act and reform health care. Uh, this is another, another opportunity because it's the implementation, implementation of 21st century cures, and then there's going to be a big effort to reform FDA um, to ensure that the procedures provide regulatory relief for innovation. Can we get drugs to the market quicker? Can we get life-saving biomedical um, technology to the market quicker? There's going to be a major push to, to take those regulations and really get the government out of the way. So it doesn't take five years to bring technology to the market. You can do it, uh, you can do it quicker. Um, Senate confirmations. Uh, this is going to be a major focus and will continue to be a major focus. We now have one Supreme Court justice that needs to be confirmed. We have, I believe, eight to 10 cabinet secretaries that still need to be confirmed. And we have 14 administration, or 1,400 administration political appointees that need to be confirmed. That's all this year, that's all in a very tight time frame while we're doing these other things. Next, comprehensive tax reform. Uh, this is gonna be a major push. Uh, speaker Ryan, the House, the uh, US Speaker of the House, or the Speaker of the US House of Rep Representatives has said that he wants to have a bill on the President's desk by the August break, August recess. That's a lot of time to get a comprehensive tax reform bill through Congress and moving forward. That's something to, to definitely pay attention to. Um, and there will be a border adjustability. Speaker Ryan is pushing border adjustability. Uh, I know that some companies that's either pro or con, a lot of companies are still trying to figure that out. Um, infrastructure investment, another major opportunity for the community because this is going to, um, this is still nebulous. It's being defined. Are we talking highways and bridges? Are we talking smart buildings, uh, optical sensors? Uh, for, for infrastructure, are we talking uh, pipelines, et cetera? I would encourage you to think big on, inf on the infrastructure investment bill. Uh, President Trump promised a $1 trillion bill. We'll see if it comes to that. Um, but what, what we know is that there's gonna be a major push 
to, um, to invest in our infrastructure to get it up to future standards, not current standards. Uh, energy sector, this is all the above, um, including solar. There's a lot of, rep um, I know there's, um, whenever you think Republicans, you traditionally don't think renewable energy, but there's a lot of support for solar and other re renewable energy within the Republican ranks. So this is something we'll have to continue to, to, uh, to track, as well as uh, particularly for the optics and photonics community, uh, the traditional energy sector as well, oil, natural gas, coal. Uh, and then workforce development and focus on innovative programs in states uh, and local communities. The Republicans are gonna to look to states and local communities and what they're doing to train tomorrow's workforce to see if they can replicate that at the federal level and then push it back to the states. Uh, the, the idea, and I know this is something that a lot of your companies focus on, is that workforce, making sure you've got the quality workforce you need to staff your companies. Um, the IBM uh, CEO termed this, um, a, as a new collar job. So not a blue collar, not a white collar, but a new collar. So you need more than a high school education, but you might need, but you need less than a, uh, than a master's degree or an undergraduate degree. And I think that's what a lot of your, uh, a lot of your uh, companies are focused on to make sure you've got the right type or you've got the right employee uh, that can provide quality to your and add value. Defense and, uh, defense and national security. Again, this is going to be another major focus area. Um, there's, uh, there's going to be some organizational changes at the Department of Defense. Uh, I would pay your, and basically the, the role there and why there's some organizational changes, to innovate, uh, to focus on innovation, and then to focus on sustainment and acquisition within major weapons programs, as well as, um, as, well as just individual programs as well. Um, there's a new directed energy weapons and associated strat, a new directed energy uh, office of the Department of Defense. That's going to be something that will be stood up this year. Uh, we've also got uh, cyber is going to be another big issue uh, to focus on. We've already, the President's already addressed that in a White House meeting, so continue to focus on cyber. Um, and then to continue to push for uh, emerging technologies like quantum technologies as well, where you can flag that. There will be, with who we're seeing going into the agencies, and particularly those who are advising the President, that senior level, uh, they are, there are a lot of technologists, there are a lot of innovators, uh, and I think that's going to be one of the major themes of the administration. Now, how does this all come together? Budget and appropriations. Um, this is where the president, traditionally the president will propose a budget for a fiscal year um, in the early February time frame. Congress will approve a budget by mid-April, ish, <laughs> I say ish because it doesn't happen that often, and then the appropriations bills or the appropriators uh, who fund the government are required to provide or to do the appropriations bill uh, by uh, the end of the fiscal year on September 30th. This year is a little different, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, Congress did not finish up its work on the FY17 budget in uh, last year, so they've now shifted into uh, they've got to finish that up. The current spend or the current budget for this year, fiscal year 17, ends April 28th. If you remember, that's one day prior to the 100-day mark. Um, the president will address a joint session of Congress on February the 28th. Uh, traditionally, that would that's that takes the place of the State of the Union. On an inaugural year, you don't have a State of the Union because it's the inaugural it's the inaugural address. So the president will address a joint session on April 28th. Um, and then you have, or sorry, February the 28th, um, and then what that means is against all of those priorities I mentioned and the president working aggressively to get something done by the 100-day mark, you've got a, you're trying to, Congress is going to try to finish up work on the FY17 budget. There's also going to be a, a national security supplemental that will include homeland security and DOD programs that comes up for 17 and they're gonna start working on the FY18 budget at the same time. So, you're, so Congress is now doing tax reform, confirmations, innovation, infrastructure, while trying to fund the government all between now and April. Great, there's a lot of churn out there, but there's opportunity to take advantage of that as well. And then why is it important, against this backdrop, it's important to engage in Washington because of those opportunities. Um, 
what I like to say uh, generally is if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. So if you choose not to engage, you're likely going to be a pay for or somebody's going to direct to you what's going to be done with your industry. And, that's, and the reason we've done this, and one of the reasons that's important and we kind of walk through this, is Beth and I and our colleagues have represented the optics and photonics community now for five years, and we've put, up, we've put points on the board, and we've been successful uh, in a Republican Congress and a Democratic, in a Democratic White House. And I'll turn to Beth, kind of walk through some of these. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. Yeah. So some of the wins that we have in, in Washington, D.C., we wanted to uh, you know, highlight some of these. The National Defense Authorization Act, also known as NDAA. We've been able to, as Josh said, have positive language on directed energy. Many of you are interested in that. Uh, the optics and photonics community came together uh, a couple of years ago and pressed successfully the Department of Defense for an integrated photonics advanced manufacturing institute. Um, now called AIM Photonics, which uh, is also under the National Defense Authorization Act. And then uh, just recently, uh, we were able to uh, extend uh, the Small Business Innovation Research, SBIR and Small Business Technology Transfer, STTR, programs uh, also within the National Defense Authorization Act. Five-year extension, the authorization was due to expire in September of this year, and now because of this, there's no lag and there's no uh, lapse. Uh, all good news. Uh, also, in the 11th hour uh, last uh, year, the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act, also of great interest to optics and photonics community. It was called America Competes to many of you, America Competes Reauthorization. We're able to get an optics and photonics provision in the act, uh, which was signed by the president in January. This uh, enables the uh, optics and photonics community to talk to federal agencies, seeking partnerships between federal agencies, industry, and academia on issues of basic research, uh, maturing uh, technologies, commercialization, and also education to workforce uh, opportunities. I want to hit on the 21st Century Cures Act. Many of you may be interested, and this is a very big win for biophotonics. Uh, this was a 10-year authorization for a few programs of interest uh, to you all, uh, cancer research at $1.8 billion over 10 years. I want to say that the optics and photonics community came together, produced a white paper and a technology roadmap in concert with the National uh, Cancer Moonshot Initiative. Uh, task force was uh, put up and was led by folks like uh, Mary Ellen Geiger of SPIE um, that led the, the effort to do this and help uh, press for funding for cancer research into the out years. Also included was a 10-year authorization for uh, the BRAIN initiative. Um, the optics and photonics community is very uh, interested in this uh, area. We put together a technology roadmap again, worked with uh, federal program managers in the offices like uh, agencies like uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, the Federal Food and Drug Administration, National Science Foundation, DARPA and IARPA, and were able to put together uh, these roadmaps and also hold technology um, uh, meetings. I uh, also want to flag here, there was extra emphasis uh, placed on uh, NIH's Brain Initiative uh, SBIR program and the opportunities for optics photonics uh, are enhanced in this area. And finally, I want to touch upon the Revitalize America Manufacturing and Innovation Act, which was passed in 2014. It codifies the Advanced Manufacturing Institute program and provides uh, authorizations for new institutes moving forward, and so opportunities there for optics and photonics industry to engage in future uh, uh, advanced manufacturing institutes. Finally, so what this all means is that none of these things would have happened without active engagement by all of you and your colleagues, all the volunteers uh, in the optics and photonics community. Uh, we need you. Uh, there are, there are uh, three ways you can do this. You can go to Washington, you can invite members of Congress, their staff, and uh, administration officials to your site for a tour, a site facility tour. You can visit members uh, when they're in district, when they're home uh, in district, or senators when they're in state. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, recognize here your leader in all of this, Krasinda Plekovic from SPIE. 
uh, and she is also wanting to talk to you, so go talk to her about the Capitol Hill Day uh, on April 24th and 25th. If none of you, if you feel like you're not well equipped to do this, don't worry. There is advocacy training, message development provided to you, and also meetings uh, set up with congressional offices uh, that are uh, that are secured. And you don't have to do much. You need to show your interest, though, and show uh, the policymakers in Washington D.C. how much optics and photonics is critical to the U.S. economy and innovation, and continue to advance uh, uh, new opportunities for your community. So thank you very much. <laughs>